Jim. What do young people worship today? What do they believe? What do they hang on to? What do they hope for? I can't speak uh, for young people, but uh, probably um, a guess would be the same things they've always uh, celebrated. Just kind of a, a joy of existence, uh, self-discovery, uh, freedom, that kind of thing. Well, there's always been a generation gap in every age, but the gap now seems to be much more of a definite cleavage. The young people today seem to feel and think differently. What do you think has brought this about? <clears throat> well, possibly it, it could have a, a strictly sociological basis. It could be uh, the, uh, the genera so-called generation gap could be a result of uh, just larger numbers of young people. Uh, I think it happened after World War II. Uh, I think it's something like over half the population in the United States now is uh, under 18 years of age, something like that. Politically and philosophically, the young people now seem to feel very definite ideas about the establishment, mm -hmm. old systems of governing people, and, and moral attitudes. Yeah. When I was in high school and college, uh, the kind of protest that's going on now is totally unheard of. Uh, at that time, uh, to be a teenager, to be young, was... Uh, uh, it was really nothing. It was kind of a limbo state, and I think it's amazing. Just in, in the last five years, what's happened is uh, young people have become increasingly aware of the power and the influence that they have as a group. It's really amazing. Does it surprise you that there's so much revolt on the campuses of this country against Washington and their policies? It really surprises me because, as I as I said before, when I was growing up in, in when I was in school, it was. Uh, that was totally unheard of. You know, students really had no power. But if you look back in history, uh, it seems to bear out the fact that every revolution has started with students and spread to workers. And uh, I'm not predicting it's, there's going to be a drastic turnover in this country, but uh, you know, all the indications are there. Life does seem to become more and more involved and complex, you know, it's becoming computerized. And dehumanized in that process. That bugs me. I wonder how it bothers you and your generation. But it does seem to be a, a trend toward a return to a kind of uh, primitive outlook on life, a more tribal attitude, and uh, I think it's an actual reaction to industrialization. But uh, unfortunately, I think it's, uh, it's kind of naive because I think uh, the future is going to become increasingly mechanized, computerized, as you call it, and uh, I don't think there's any turning back. It's just figuring out a way to survive and thrive in that kind of society. Well, I don't think there's any, uh, any chance of, of going back. And uh, look at it this way, too. The, uh, the hippie lifestyle is really middle-class phenomenon, and it could not exist in any other society except ours where there's such an incredible surfeit of uh, uh, goods, products, and leisure time. Uh, I think that's, that's the reason for it because the generations immediately preceding ours had uh, uh, world wars and um, oppressions to contend with and uh, for the last 10 or 15 years in this country it's uh, there's time enough and there's, there's money enough to live a, a kind of a flagrant, uh, outrageous lifestyle, which was impossible before. Jim, there's a line in your book of poems which reads, The cleavage of men and actor and spectators is the central fact of our time. I think that's undeniable, but I wonder, hasn't it always been that way with society? I suppose it has, but um, it's uh, with mass media, you know, today, it becomes more immediately apparent I think what I was concerned with in that book is the fact that most people feel completely void and helpless in controlling their own destinies, in controlling the destiny of human life. And uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's sad. More people should be involved rather than uh, designating all these uh, 
powers to a few individuals. I mean, the, uh, the average person, whatever that is, should, should be part of it somehow. And I, I think everyone feels that events are just going on without their uh, knowledge and control. It's uh, one of the tragedies of our time. I, I suppose it has always been that way, but now it's, it just becomes so obvious, you know. Decisions are made for you which you have no part of at all. I just met the fact that uh, so many people are uh, content with uh, living very uh, quiet, well-mannered, orderly life when so many uh, obvious injustices, I guess, are, are going on. And they, and they just uh, seem to ignore it somehow or, or, not, or not care at all. Just let it happen. Without ever becoming involved, I think that's that. Jim, relevant to, to your theory of people should get more involved in life and thus enjoy it more, you have written a line of poetry which means the spectator is a dying animal. Now, isn't it a bit of contradiction to what you've said previously? No, it's uh, yeah, it's concerned with that same split between the actor and the audience. Uh, to me, there's something incredibly sad about a bunch of human beings sitting down watching something take place it just when you think about it i love movies as much as anyone else but the, the spectacle of millions and millions of people sitting in movie theaters in front of television sets every night watching a second or third hand reproduction of reality going on when the real world is right there in the living room or right right outside in the street or down the block somewhere I think it's a, I think it's a tool uh, to synambulize or hypnotize people into a kind of uh, waking sleep. But I think the major uh, influence in uh, the next decade or so is going to be people, I don't know what, what you'd call them except maybe connectors. The people who are able to assemble masses, huge masses of people into one spot, as, as we've witnessed in the pop festivals in the last two or three years. The kind of people that can assemble huge crowds in one spot, I think, uh, would be the uh, major influences on mass culture in the next decade. Mm -hmm. I hope the, uh, the rock music enthusiasts have created some of the, probably some of the most exciting music and theatrical events on the planet. I think they're fantastic. Part of the generation gap is the difference in what people like in terms of music. Now the rock and hard rock do seem to go hand in hand with the younger crowd. And some of us who are a little older are confused and puzzled by that. Because we can't quite cotton on to this. Um, you, can you understand that? You know, adolescence and uh, early youth, the uh, the fires are burning fastest, right? And the energy level is probably at its highest, and uh, so it demands a kind of raucous, screaming type music. And uh, I'm 26 now, and uh, I'm uh, I'm getting more interested in uh, jazz, to tell you the truth. Uh, I I can't even listen to the radio anymore. You know, I like old old blues cats and. Uh, uh, early rock and roll and, and some other things, but frankly, I find most of it really boring. This is something that uh, discusses me a little bit. It seems that the young people like all the same kind of thing. You know, I, I want more out of young people who says that. Yeah, well, they're, they're being programmed by the radios. They only play uh, the, major, the major radio stations, rock stations, they only play 30 songs over and over and over, 24 hours a day. And it's been proven that what you hear the most is what you like the most. So there's really no choice involved. Someone's programming. Well, it comes to media. Yeah. What everyone should say is the medium is the message, and the message is me. And that's the answer is for everyone to, uh, you're asking for an answer. The answer is for everyone to stand up and say, I'm me.
and be fully aware of that fact and let everyone else know that you are yourself and expressive. You were talking about the communication, watching the box, etc., etc., being victimized by the media. Well, there's a sort of a voyeurism in here, the new level line, which is more or less we're all affected with the psychology of voyeur. That to me seems to be a track. What it is, is somehow life gets restricted to what can be seen rather than what can be touched or experienced physically. I don't know it is a natural, uh, civilized human uh, fear of uh, involvement because, you know, touch can lead to a lot of uh, touch. Physical involvement leads to all the, you know, the real basic existential modes of life. Sex, death, love, you know, they have really nothing to do with, with seeing, experiencing second hand, you have to be able to actually do it. Right? There just seems to be some kind of natural civilized inclination to avoid contact with the nitty gritty of life. Well, we can't talk about life today with, and not talk about sex. Now, this confuses me because we have a so called new morality, and I keep looking at it and trying to figure out what it is. There is, though, you know. I can remember when I was in high school, even college which wasn't that many years ago. And, uh, sex was still, uh, in the Victorian age. It was, uh, very hush-hush. Uh, you know, you suspected a girl of, uh, you know, one of the ones that was doing it. You know, it was like, you know, kind of, a, you know, locker room conversations. Uh, I think, uh, that this, this new group of kids that have come along have you know, I mean, sex will always be a mystery, and will always have its hang-ups and strange things about it. But they're much more free, I and mean, it's just, uh, you know, accepted as a fact of life, and not, you know, not something to be uh, uh, snickered about in private, you know, behind closed doors and all that. I think there, there definitely is a new side. I think it, it was a necessary reaction to some kind of uh, weird uh, repression. I don't know how it started, you know, then, but uh, it was totally unnatural. And I think uh, that is one aspect of the new thing that's happening that is completely beneficial. Uh, sexual, the repression of sexual energy has always been the grandest tool of a totalitarian system. The, if everyone was uh, free in their sexual activity, uh, how many people would show up to work? That is, that's the basic problem, whether progress, uh, the progress of civilization, the evolution of a civilized culture is really worth it. And, uh, you know, there have been some amazing accomplishments, beautiful accomplishments, but the question is, is it worth it? Is it worth the uh, repression? And that's something everyone has to answer uh, every second of their life. When, when you talk to young people, you, you, you know, go through them see them all the time. You get the impression from them. They think the life is worthwhile, that it's worth living, that's a ball. I'll tell you the damn truth. I don't know many young people. I really don't. I mean, uh, I usually, I hang out with my contemporaries, and uh, I, I really don't have that much contact with young people. You're 26 years younger than me. Yeah. I'm over the hill. You wish you were 10 years younger? Yeah. Well, I, I think generations now happen every year, or maybe every month, you know, rather than, it used to be, I don't know, 10 years or something like that, but I think there's a, a new, things are changing so fast, there's a new generation every year at least. You know, I don't think there's any topic that does sort of define the young revolution more than the topic of war. I don't know anyone that's really in favor of war, but today we see that have an entire young generation absolutely opposed to the idea of it. And probably because they're the ones that always fight the wars. They're the human clutter in the war machine. And there just seems to be no, no way around it. There's just no cause. I'm not sure it, I'm sure that the whole base is the war going on now is economic. And, uh, I think uh, young people just got tired of being grist for the mill. But you know, uh, the in the, uh, the comfortable position of your TV set in your living room, war is very uh, 
matter how horrible it makes the horror, it makes it very glamorous. It's a very glamorous life and death right there at the screen. And we're all affected from youth, you know, with, um, with kids around the war, from uh, cowboy the Indians, or anything like that. Somehow it's just ingrained in you from the beginning. There's something heroic, you know, feeling yourself and dying and everything. Now you're killing it. I love you as a good man who's been 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 a good man who Well, society's always needed to have the worst killer. Now, where are you today? What is the worst? What type of it? The movie was probably the political activist. In the 20s, it was sport figures, 30s, and 40s, it was uh, movie stars and the uh, uh, World War II AZ uh, kind of thing. And the, and the music uh, figures became the US. I think the next two ways will, will probably be a uh, more intellectual sort. The little activist and has scientists and uh, computer experts, people like that. People that, that have an understanding, an intellectual awareness, and the knowledge of how things work, how they decide to work, will probably be more. I think uh, each generation uh, supersedes the last one. You know, Intelligence and awareness, and I think you can have a chance to do some young people. I've seen them like Charlie Brown, you know, while I'm very young and naive for all the ways. I think they have incredible intelligence and awareness and events that far surpasses the people I've met. I think, you know, like you can submit it, and I think the most things. They're far better to handle what's coming. Well, we'll have to. We've been talking about life today. We have business today. There's actual relationship, the relationship between men and women. And we all wonder how much, much it has changed. The role of the man in modern life and the woman in modern life. We even have a horrible thing called Unisac, which terrifies me. Do you think that much of a difference in the style of life affecting the man-woman relationship today? Well, you know, uh, when you look at history, It seems to be cyclical. There, there have been many periods in history where women were the, the major controlling influence in life, matriarchal societies and all that kind of thing. I, I think, um, I think women are becoming increasingly important. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous thing to, to try and talk about you know, in such simple terms, but I think uh, the influence of women is becoming more and more felt. Uh, I'm not sure I can expand on that, but I think you know what I mean. I think you know that the unisex trip is uh, really a cop out. What's happening is life is becoming more and more feminized. I think so. That the male is now less masculine because he has no need to be very masculine. Yeah, that's true. And uh, yeah, there's no uh, there's no frontier to conquer. And, hunting and fishing and all that, you know, I mean, it's not just uh, a basic survival thing, and uh, I think life is becoming increasingly feminized. Soft to a man. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's good? Sure. Why? Well, I think uh, women have it all over men, really. You know, I really think they have the right idea. Which is what? Well, uh less inclination toward intellectualizing things and the need for formalizing and idealizing life and just simply accepting it and living it. We tend to think of women as being starry-eyed and romantic, but if you think about it, that most of the romanticized is the idealists are men. Well, very true. You think that would change? Yeah, I think it's cyclical, but I think uh, In a, in a highly complex and industrialized system, which, which we're engaged in, uh, machines take the place of uh, an earnest day-to-day -day task.
tackling uh, survival. And uh, when that disappears, then uh, you get increased feminization. Well, you're a student of the summer. You've studied the summer at UCLA. And one of the things that you've written about the summer is this. It's wrong to assume that some have done that cinema belongs to women. Cinema is created by men for conservation of them. Do you enlarge on that? Well, who makes all the films? Who runs the projection booth? You know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's somehow it's a masculine desire to dominate life rather than just accepting it and flowing with it. And I think that is responsible for the, for the creation of films and uh, a lot of other things. Well, men are dominant in the arts, aren't they? As writers, composers, actors, almost everything. Yeah, there, there are very few uh, uh, female artists. Do you think they're wise to keep out of it? Well, uh, yeah, I do. Although, you know, it, it's a contradiction because I'm totally hung up in the art game. But I think, uh, you know, women have less need to reestablish a connection with life because they are life. still here, and violet, and certain. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the white blind light, jumped, humped, born to suffer, made to undress in the wilderness. All of us have found a safe niche where we can store up riches and talk to our fellows. In the same premise of disaster. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the white blind light. Let me tell you about heartache and the loss of God, wandering, wandering, a hopeless night. Moonshine night, mountain village, insane in the woods and the deep trees. The deep trees. The deep trees. Your home is still here. Oh, 
immaculate. Stone immaculate. Immaculate. Stone immaculate. Thank you, O oh Lord.